Good evening. A few years back, we reported about the mysterious deaths of honeybees occurring around the world. It became known as Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD, and it's where large numbers of honeybees disappear from their hives without a trace, leading to the deaths of entire colonies. Scientists still don't know what causes this phenomenon, but many now see the threat to honeybees as bigger and more ominous than just CCD. Tonight, a new investigation into growing questions about the role of a new class of pesticides, what we know and what we don't know about their impact on honeybees, and ultimately, our entire food system. Commercial honeybees are the workhorse of modern agriculture. These guys here are pollinating these flowers. Almost two million colonies are rented out to U.S. farmers each year to pollinate much of what we'll eventually eat. Oh. It's hard to imagine American agriculture without bees. A farmer's market would be a pretty barren place. No peaches, cucumbers, pears, apples, cherries, pumpkins, avocado, almonds, zucchini, watermelon, or blueberries. These are some of the many crops almost entirely dependent on honeybees for pollination. And now consider this. In the United States, beekeepers are now losing 30 to 50 percent of their hives each year. With reports of bee deaths coming in from all over the U.S., Europe, the Middle East, and some parts of Asia, we face unknown but potentially devastating consequences on the world's food supply. With the stakes so high, beekeepers across the country are desperately looking for answers. Tom Theobald is a small beekeeper in central Colorado and an unlikely leader of a national movement to challenge America's pesticide policy. He lost 50 to 60 percent of his hives last winter. The electric fence keeps the bears out of the bee yard. Well, the question obviously is what's causing this? This is very unusual. This just doesn't happen in the bee world. Theobald's beehives are surrounded by rich farmland, growing barley, hay, sugar beets, and corn. His bees search for pollen across thousands of these acres, and since he'd ruled out usual causes of bee deaths, he began to look to the fields for answers, and soon realized something different was going on. I began investigating and I began looking at corn. Now corn is one of those crops that has been treated, the seed is treated with one of the systemic pesticides, clothianidin. Systemic pesticides are a new type of pesticide that have changed the game of insect control in the past 15 years. Traditionally, pesticides are sprayed on the surface of leaves or put in the soil to directly kill unwanted insects, and then they wear off or wash away a short time after application and have to be sprayed again. Systemic pesticides, however, are absorbed by the plant, so they become part of the body of the plant for the life of the plant. They are taken up by the roots and leaves and can move to all parts, including the pollen and nectar. The systemic pesticides are always there. There's no escape from them, and they are there whether there's a pest problem or not. Anything that chews or sucks on that plant is affected by that pesticide. Farmers like these systemic pesticides because they require a lot less spraying. Derived from nicotine, they're called neonicotinoids and have quickly become the fastest growing and among the most widely used insecticides in the world. Theobald started looking into records of the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Pesticides, which approves or registers pesticides for market. What he found shocked him. What I discovered was a series of Environmental Protection Agency memos which documented the consideration of that product for registration the first of which was February of 2003, in which the EPA scientists said that they recognized that 
these systemic pesticides were highly toxic to the bees and they took the prudent course which was to determine the safety of this product before it was released to the market. Theobald read in documents that EPA scientists wanted field tests on bees and thought those would have to be completed before the pesticides were available to the public. But he soon found out that is not what actually happened. Congress had created a provision in pesticide policy called conditional registration, where pesticides can hit the shelves after a set of core safety studies, but before all of the environmental effects are known. In this case, the chemical was shown to be highly toxic to bees in the lab, but it was allowed onto the market anyway while they awaited further field tests on long-term impacts to bee colonies. And just who is responsible for doing these honeybee field studies? The chemical companies do the testing. The companies do the testing. Yes, most people are unaware of the fact that that in fact does occur. Steve Ellis is a large commercial beekeeper from Barrett, Minnesota, and the secretary of the National Honey Bee Advisory Board. He lost 43% of his hives last winter. Chemical companies hire their own people or their own labs or a research scientist to do product safety testing of their products. They design the tests, they conduct the tests, they pay for the tests. Not the EPA. Not the EPA. They present their tests and some other tests that they can come across and then a packet is submitted. And EPA reviews these tests that are submitted to them. Beekeepers and citizens groups say this is like asking a fox to design the best chicken coop to protect the chickens. And questions are growing as to whether the EPA is holding industry adequately accountable. They point to Bayer Crop Science a division of the pharmaceutical giant. In 2003, when Bayer applied for approval of their new systemic pesticide for use on corn seeds, a compound called clothianidin, memos show that EPA scientists asked for field studies to be completed in one and a half years to determine long-term impacts on honeybee colonies. But the pesticide was on the market for a full four years before they submitted their results. Bayer's own analysis reported the compound was safe for bees. The EPA accepted that. But beekeeper Tom Theobald in Colorado saw something very suspicious. The test area the company used to verify their product was safe? Turns out it was only a two and a half acre plot. This bee yard behind me will forage over several thousand acres. And to have a study that proposes that putting them on two and a half acres of canola planted from treated seed is going to give us any kind of valid science is ridiculous. And Theobald wasn't the only one calling the industry tests bad science. Anyone with a basic understanding of honeybee biology would look at that, that test and say this is not a good test design. Dr. Jim Fraser is an entomologist at Penn State University and is the scientific advisor to the National Honey Bee Advisory Board. He is also called upon by the EPA Office of Pesticides to consult on bee health. And he even worked for industry as a senior scientist at DuPont before conducting his own independent research. In fact, the average foraging area for a honeybee colony is about 28,000 acres. And so you have to be very cautious in your interpretation of what the treated pollen impact is likely to be or not be on a colony. But more importantly, Fraser says, is that industry tests are not subject to scientific review by the independent community. And so there's no opportunity for replication or verification that these results are in fact real. Without a lot of honeybee expertise within the EPA, that makes them have a limited capacity to really review and carefully critique these kinds of studies. While industry studies may not be finding any direct connection between pesticides and overall declines in bee populations, Dr. Fraser says a study he and his team at Penn State conducted shows cause for alarm. Their sampling of hives across the United States found an average of six different pesticides in each sample, 
and in some cases, as many as 39 pesticides. Some of these are systemic pesticides. I think no one had any idea that, that it could be this, uh, this large uh, uh, a residue problem. And because the residue consists of insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, miticides that differ in different places across the country, combinations of five or six or seven of these materials, there is no toxicological literature that exists for what are the consequences of these combinations of things when ingested or contacted by honeybees or any other insect. And that's one of the biggest concerns for scientists and beekeepers, that the government agency charged with making sure pesticides are safe is not asking the questions they should be asking. I think the EPA registration system has been designed to look for short-term toxic consequences of a compound, so something that will kill the insect outright. But then the long-term consequences of that are very complicated and very complex to figure out and very difficult to uh, show experimentally. It's not part of the thinking, really. What's more concern is a dose of insecticide below what is necessary to kill can have what we call sublethal impacts that might alter behavior, it might alter memory, it might alter development, it might alter all kinds of things. So the potential ways in which a lower dose of, of uh, pesticide could be impacting the insects is tremendous. While the impact on bees is very much in question, what the EPA has been able to determine is that this class of pesticide is much safer for humans than older pesticides on the market. For one, because farmers use less of them. Lower toxicity to mammals in general is a feature that we're always uh, kind of tar trying to target that uh, innovation and research around. And then just over Jay Vroom is president and CEO of CropLife America, the nation's largest trade organization representing the pesticide industry. He says that not only do we need to get the safest options for humans on the market as quickly as possible, but also that the burdens of feeding the world's population is increasing and pesticides have done wonders for getting more food per acre. Sometime yet this year in 2011, the world population is going to cross over 7 billion. Uh, to me, more important is the fact that one billion of us, or probably more, went to bed hungry last night, and thousands of us that were in that one billion uh, category won't go to sleep tonight because we will die uh, due to malnutrition. That just is unacceptable given the fact that we have the means to improve agricultural output and productivity and supply more food. According to Vroom, the bottom line is no one has proven a definitive link between systemic pesticides and loss of honeybee colonies. There is no direct causation that's been identified with regard to these insecticides and the overall bee health issues. But the research continues and, and the research uh, uh, continues to be supported by everyone uh, that is a member of our association, including the manufacturers of those products. We asked the company Bayer Crop Science for an interview. They declined. They did issue a statement saying in part, the use of seed treatment products has been widely adopted because of their excellent performance. And the company also said, there have been no documented effects on colony health due to long-term exposure. But many argue there are links and studies on honeybees and pesticides are now coming in from around the world. We'll have that part of our investigation for you next. Tom Theobald had a surprise last summer. He'd just written an article called do we have a pesticide blowout for a trade magazine? In it, he criticized Bayer for conducting their study on honeybees on a relatively tiny plot of land. That same study concluded that on that small plot, systemic pesticides were safe for bees. Theobald wrote that it was, quote, 
a mockery of science. Shortly after his article was published, he got some interesting news. I got a call from an EPA employee at headquarters who said, Tom, you should be the first to know, and went on to explain that the scientists had gone back and reviewed that original study because of the uh, request on the part of the chemical companies to expand its use and had concluded that it was not a valid scientific study. In a stunning reversal, the EPA did an about face. They were now agreeing with the small beekeeper in Colorado, saying that the safety study from Bayer was deficient. This after the Bayer pesticide had been on the market for eight years. A government source told us on background that the change was a routine reevaluation, but the beekeeping community was furious. Is this compound being used in cornfields today? Yes. It is? Yes. Where's the EPA? Why haven't they said, stop? Well, a number of organizations signed a letter directed to EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson requesting just exactly that, that until the controversy over the science on this with pollinators can be resolved and, and good field studies that can be conducted, that as a precautionary move, the product be taken off the market. That hasn't been done? No. That sense of exasperation extends beyond the beekeeping community and into the EPA itself. Sources within the agency we talked to said the handling of pesticide regulation has been the source of tension for years. Many scientists said their concerns have been ignored by the administrators handling the approval process. We asked the EPA for an interview. They declined. So we wanted to find someone who could help explain how the EPA decides which pesticides stay on the market. I think we have a misconception. Bill Coniglio spent his career as a scientist for the EPA and was one of the first to set up their office of toxic substances where he studied the impact of such materials as lead and pesticides on humans. He now owns a nursery in New Jersey and is an amateur beekeeper himself. The general public basically says, it is registered, therefore it must be safe. That is not true. There is a risk associated with exposure to the compound, and that risk may be minimal based upon the knowledge available at the time, or the judgments made at the time, but it is not absolute safety. The EPA is required by Congress to approve a pesticide based on what's called a risk-benefit analysis. Its decision considers the economic benefit to farmers, technological, political, and social factors. Science is only one of the factors Congress allows them to consider. Scientists in EPA have always been frustrated with risk assessment, risk management. The inability to take and to address the risk has always been there. Whether we're talking about air programs, whether we're talking about drinking water programs, whether we're talking about pesticides or uh, rugs or indoor air, uh, it has always been that way. Coniglio says that at the EPA, decisions are made by administrators, not the scientists who review the safety data. And both he and sources inside the EPA tell us that they themselves don't even know how management determines what pesticides are approved, and that the agency does not reveal enough about the process to the public. However, the EPA does make available on its website the analysis of its scientists, and documents we've uncovered suggest the scientists' warnings haven't been taken seriously, including the fact that systemic pesticides build up in the soil and can remain for many years. Also, because the pesticides show up in pollen and nectar, they have potential for, quote, long-term toxicity and risk, quote, the eventual stability of the hive. And then there is this. Years before colony collapse disorder was identified, EPA scientists speculated about symptoms that sound similar to CCD. Will the exposed foragers become disoriented 
and failed to return to the colony. Nevertheless, the EPA says it doesn't have enough cause to limit use of these pesticides at this time. It's a much different story elsewhere. In Europe, for example, the European Union can and is keeping some systemic pesticides off the market for certain uses until it feels they are safe for bees. It is argued that there is no proven scientific evidence of the causal link. And yet there are a number of scientific studies that have been carried out which suggest that there is a causal link. A special conference was convened in March of this year that brought together European Union parliamentary members, scientists and beekeepers to address the long-term effects of systemic pesticides on pollinators. In 2008, um, major honey producers such as Argentina, Turkey and some EU countries lost at least one-third of their colonies. There may be some debate about the cause of this loss of colonies, uh, but you can't dispute the fact it's happening. And therefore, the need for urgent studies uh, and urgent steps to be taken um, is very pressing. That's just what several individual European governments have decided to do. France, Germany and Italy have already restricted systemic pesticides for some uses after studies conducted in those countries showed links between pesticides and impacts on bee health. For now, the EPA has decided that a warning label on these pesticides is good enough. That label says simply, do not apply this product to blooming parts of plants if bees are present. Scientists say that does not work with systemic pesticides. The systemic pesticides are different from past pesticides. That means an entire redesign of the methodology used by EPA in risk assessment and risk management. And that is their challenge. There are some signs that the EPA is beginning to recognize the potential scope of the problem and is making some positive steps forward. This past January, the agency initiated a global conference trying to develop new approaches to determining potential risk of these pesticides to pollinators. The EPA says it stands by the overall safety of this class of pesticides and sent us this statement, quote, EPA is concerned about the decline of honeybees and other pollinators. This year, EPA scientists will begin an extensive re-evaluation of the pesticide clothianidin and will include the public in its re-evaluation. If regulatory action to protect pollinators is needed, we will implement any necessary restrictions." End quote. This isn't just about bees and farmland. These systemic pesticides can likely be found in a backyard near you. Look closely at the labels at your local garden store and you will see the telltale chemicals used in a range of products. Scientists worry this is an ever-growing list and they still don't know the long-term impact of these pesticides on honeybees. Let's say that there is no risk. The data, when it's available, clears them all. That'd be a great thing, be a wonderful thing. However, how can you take and make that judgment without the data since you know that the compound is incorporated into nectar, since you have studies from universities showing that concentrations of exposure have adverse effects, how do you allow it to be used without the data that shows it's not a problem. You do that by taking and say, we judge the risk to be not as important as the benefits. And in that balance, that risk-benefit balance, it's obvious that they are not considering the collapse of the entire food chain. They're dealing with the benefits from a short-term perspective. Our sources within the EPA have told us that the agency's public assurances about the safety of this class of pesticides mask what's really going on within the EPA. They said there has been a flurry of high-level meetings, 
and we were shown notes from one such meeting that suggests the agency has been urgently rethinking how it regulates these pesticides and admitting they don't have acceptable studies for bee safety.